Hi and welcome to O State TV. I'm Emily Bjorkland and I'm joined today by the legendary Terry Crews. <laughs> <laughs> legendary! <laughs> oh, it's too much pressure. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so what are you excited about with coming out here to OSU and talking to students out here today? Um, well, first of all, I am 50 years old and to have, you know, basically the young people of this generation, you know, because I'm on the other generation, <laughs> uh, ask me to come out and speak at universities has been, it's just, I'm, I'm probably more honored than anything. It's like unbelievable because, you know, this is the future. You know, everyone here is going to be running everything for the next 30, 40 years. And they really want to hear my story. They want to hear my viewpoint. Uh, and it's just an honor. Your career journey itself is quite expansive. I mean, you started out as a courtroom sketch artist in, in <laughs> Flint, Michigan. Yes. You then went on and you were a football player in the NFL, then you were an actor, and now you're a huge activist for victims of assault. So kind of take me through that whole journey. Oh it. my God, that's a, it's a long story. <laughs> no, uh, you, know, it, uh, you know what I did? It, the thing for me was that I just did what I loved, you know, and it was no rules to that. You know, it's, it's just, I don't care if I'm making any money, um, and I, 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 it wasn't about how much I was going to get if I did this. It was about, am I happy creatively? Do I like what I'm doing? Do I like who I am? Um, and you know what's weird? Considering all the things I've done, I mean, I, again, started out, like I said, courtroom sketch artist, uh, uh, artist. I always paint my, my teammates in the NFL. And I would, you know, when I get cut from a team, I would go back in a locker room, paint those guys for extra money and do all that stuff. And then they end up in Hollywood and doing all that stuff. I actually have a furniture line. I've been designing furniture really? right now. Um, but considering all those things and, and all those things that I, I, I love to do, I, I really feel like I'm just getting started. <laughs> like, I don't, I, I, I don't know what I'll be doing in the next five years. I just want any, everything that I do to really bring honor to me and to bless people and to help people. And I think entertainment is that. Entertainment, I mean, what really flipped me out is when I remember getting letters from people who, like this mom, and she had a son, and the son passed away. And, but he had, his, he had a collection of everything I ever did. And she was in tears telling me about how much fun they would have watching Longest Yard, White Chicks, um, all the movies, uh, Everybody Hates Chris and stuff. And man, it, it made me realize, my God, this is this is bigger than I ever thought. The influence, the you know, the inspiration, what you do is really important. Now, another thing that was really important for me is to not just do that as an image, to do it as a person. Because the thing you can have in Hollywood and politics and sports is images, but the people can be really, really corrupt. Uh, and that's one thing I experienced just all my time growing up. And I, and I do this when I do a lot of my talks and just to really unify what kind of person you are. Um, because a lot of times people are propping up images and there's nothing underneath there. And people say, well, as long as we got the image, we'll be fine with that. But that's not enough. If you are someone who has been very open about your struggles with the mental side of things, with yeah. like with the growing up, with the struggles of having to be in the NFL, why do you think it was so important for you to then come out and kind of what made you want to be so open about it? I lived, I, I was a part of the whole toxic masculine, masculinity world. I was a part of it. I was guilty, you know, and... You know, when, when my wife left me, I was like, whoa, okay, this didn't do me any good. You know what I mean? Because again, and the image was great. Hollywood didn't care that your family's gone. You know what I mean? They don't care. They're like, hey, but, oh, look, great, now we can put you in three more movies. And you're like, but my life's falling apart. They're like, ah, what is that? Oh, sorry, we, we're trying to book you for this and this and this. And you're like, no one cares. But the thing is, is that you're, you're, basically trying to impress the wrong people. And one thing I realized is that by telling my story, by talking about these things, because I came forward, I had to come forward to some things just with my wife. This is how it started. 
You just come forward about your deepest, darkest secret to your wife. And then all of a sudden, your world changed. Now, I thought I would be shunned and banished and I would disintegrate into a pile of dust. But what happened was she was like, I love you more. I was like, whoa, that's crazy. Then I said, you know what? There's something to this telling your story to people you trust. For me, I remember just saying, you know what? This is a problem that I see that guys and men especially never share their heart. They never share the things they've gone through. I had an addiction to pornography. And I remember I went on Facebook Live. The, uh, Facebook gave me the app early. And they were like, hey, Facebook Live, it'd be great. You know, you go out there and have some fun and make some jokes. And I was like, I'm addicted to porn. They were like, holy cow. <laughs> Everybody was like, what is happening? Look, Facebook Live went crazy. It went viral. All the media wanted me on their morning news, GMA, Today Show, uh, the talk. All of them wanted me on the next day. I was just like, look at my Facebook Live. Again, you think you're going to disintegrate. You think everybody's going to be looking at you like you're crazy. You know what I got? People were like, me too, man. I got that problem. I got that issue. I had major, major celebrities come up to me like, how'd you beat it, dude? I'm going, dude, we are not telling the truth here. And then I realized, you know what? If anybody's going to tell, and then I started looking around like, you know what? If, if you look around and you realize there's something that needs to be done, and you look around and you're the only one standing there, it's probably got to be you. You know what I mean? And I realized this is something I can do. This is one thing I can do to make the world a little bit better is tell my story. And it never helped me more than what happened to me in 2016 um, with my former agency. Because for some reason they thought, oh, this is something he's going to be quiet about. And it couldn't have been more wrong. So because of you being so open with that and being able to share your story, you were included in that 2017 Time Magazine Person of the Year group. What was that like? First of all, the women that came forward, um, that was, they were my inspiration. Um, but when that whole Harvey Weinstein scandal broke down, uh, what was making me angry and really motivating me and inspiring me was the fact that so many men all over social media were calling these women liars, were calling them uh, prostitutes, basically. And they were saying they, they just wanted a payday. And I was going, okay, but I didn't come forward with that information simply because I wanted to work, just like they did. But I had been through enough therapy and been through and been reading enough and been working enough on myself through those years to understand don't be shamed i will not be shamed and repeating repeating that statement over i remember going on the red carpet it was gq men in a year party and it just came out and i remember feeling like because the temptation is you feel like you want to go into a hole you want to gr grab your hat because this is the thing many many people who've been through this they're shamed and they're dogged out and they go into this hole and they never come out. And I knew to reverse that because of my therapy, what I had read and what I knew it was like, the temptation is to be silent and quiet. So now you must be vocal and out there. That was hard. So is that why when you really emphasize this term toxic masculinity, it's so important for you to keep this conversation going? Yes, it's, it is valuable. It's valuable. And you know what was crazy is that the more I valued myself, the stronger I got. Because you realize there's a lot of guys that walk around and, and it's, it's about being tough. So they all, hey man, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Oh yeah, no, no. I, you just fall off a building. And I, listen, I've been at parties and events. I remember there was a guy, he was on a motorcycle. He was doing wheelies on a motorcycle. The bike tripped up. He fell over the handlebars. Bike ran him over. His leg was bent underneath him. He gets up. Blood, scars, rips in his jeans, and he continues around the party. He limps around the party like, no, I'm good. I'm good, man. I was like, man, look. You're like, you're not good. <laughs> go to the hospital, man. I was like, dude, go to the hospital, please. He was like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Let me tell you something. I ran into the same guy years later. He said, Terry, 
I should have went to the hospital. <laughs> now, now, you got to understand, this is the trap that men are in. It's a trap. You can't say you're hurt. You're not allowed. And I said, this is, I got to free people from that. If, if, if I have to be that sacrifice to say, hey, man, I couldn't handle it. A lot of things I just couldn't handle. Uh, I have to say it. And you know what happens? People go, hey, man, me too. Because just the problem is you feel like you're all alone. If some young lady was molested as a kid, she feels like the only one. And if no one ever tells her that she's not alone, she will feel that way and she will be in that shame forever. Same thing with the guys. And I am all, it's funny because my story, your story, anyone else's story tends to free people. You know what I mean? It's all of a sudden people go, oh my God, I wasn't by myself. I'm not crazy. Because the deal is, whoever your predator is is trying to make you feel like you're insane. That's called gaslighting. The whole thing was when, it, when I came out with my story, the agency was like, oh no, we, we were just kidding. It was a big joke. And, you know, in fact, Terry Crews is trying to capitalize off the women who've really been brutalized. I was like, holy cow, y'all really gonna play me like that? They're like, they're like literally like Terry's trying to pimp this whole thing and he's, he's, he's nuts. And I was like, wow, and you know exactly what you did. But the thing is, in the end, it all came out because he resigned. And they had to give me my money back because they started to go, you know, we're now we sense a pattern. I said, I told you that in the beginning. But it feels, it, it, again, it feels validating. But now, now it's about helping. Now, where do we go from here? You know what I mean? This is not about revenge and this and this. It's about, hey guys, this is the Emancipation Proclamation. But right after that, there was reconstruction, which was hell. Uh, kind of to close us out here, you mentioned earlier how you know you kind of you were doing things that matter to you. I mean, you've spoken at galas and said you know promoting movies and stuff is fun, but now talking for victims of assault is my calling. So, what can your advice be to you know this young generation of us that are in our early twenties who we may have these grand ideas of the things that we want to do, we may have this calling, but it's the idea of well we need to graduate because we need to have, we need to have a paycheck ready for us. And yeah. we, need to have, we need to go for things that are going to make us the money, not because that's the fun thing to do, but that's because that's the expectation for us to do. You know what? Uh, this is the deal. Um, what happens is, you, you, it, it, and this is my advice to the young generation, is that don't think too big. What, what, and this is what I mean. Think big, but you got to start small. It's the little thing. It's not, I have to jump up and stand up in front of 100,000 people. What it is, is every time you sense yourself being treated as less than a human being, kick back. Like, don't let anyone ever treat you as less than a human being. Soon as you demand you be treated as a full-fledged human being, you're an activist. You're not saying you're better than anybody. You're not saying you're worse than anybody. You're just saying, excuse me, I'm standing here. Excuse me, you can't step over me. Well, thank you so much for taking the oh, time to sit here and talk with us. And thank you all for joining us here on O-State TV. I'm Emily Bjorklund, and we'll see you next time.